Hi, I'm Lisa Turkers. I'm here today with Jim, our counselor and therapist in mm -hmm. our discussion. Jim Cress, he is uh, here in Charlotte, North Carolina, has an amazing practice. Mm -hmm. And actually, he's the counselor I've worked with so much here in Charlotte and really, really appreciate. Then I also have the resident theologian for our oh, conversation yeah. today, <laughs> director of theology with Proverbs 31 Ministries, Joel Mutamale, who has, I've also worked with, but not in a therapeutic sense, right. just in studying all of these great principles in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So our last therapy and theology conversation was around narcissism. What mm -hmm. is it? Where does it come from? Uh, what does it do when it presents itself? And today I want to almost have part two of yeah. that conversation. Mm -hmm and talk about what do we do if we are in a relationship with someone who is presenting some narcissistic tendencies. But let's back up first, Jim, and tell the story of where the term narcissism or narcissist even comes from. Be glad to. It comes from really from Greek mythology. And there's this guy, Narcissus, who um, was, to, to give you the shorter version, looking into a reflecting pool and saw his image and fell in love with that image so much that he could not do anything but stare at his own self and then eventually died. Hmm. And, and who could be around him would be an echo who could only echo what they heard Narcissus say. So a miserable, lonely existence. So it could sound exciting at first, I get to look at myself in the mirror and the reflecting pool and fall in love with myself, but the end is a tragic, existentially alone death. Mm. Mm. And in that story, what was the echo doing? Echoing only what he said, which ties in to the feed, the narcissistic feed, the empaths who are there, often we use the word codependent, that they are there to really be in the dance of or the relationship with a narcissist is you better be good at echoing what he is saying or she is saying about him or herself and echoing and feeding back. It is a perpetual mirror, different than the mirror we talked about in the previous podcast of what a mother and a baby or even a father and a baby needs to mirror back basically worship. Thou art worthy, I worship you at all costs. Mm -hmm. They'll always seek an echo. Yeah. And Joel, you know, in a spiritual sense, this brings up all kinds of things, mm -hmm. right? Yes, like because mm -hmm. if you hear that, that, you know, a narcissist needs us to echo back worship, our mind can instantly go, well, is God that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think we have a couple of spiritual things that we must remember about mm -hmm. God, that he is the only one mm -hmm. able to handle worship yep. because he doesn't do it. He, he doesn't receive it like a human receives it. And he doesn't do with it what a human would do with it, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard this quote before that the human heart is not created for fame. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you could almost say the human heart is not created for worship in that way. So what are your thoughts around that? Um, Augustine, uh, uh, a South African bishop of Hippo, he has a, a famous quote, one of my favorite quotes of his. He says, our hearts um, were are restless until they find their rest in yeah. you. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, God in his perfection, um, the, one of the first acts that he does is create, he creates creation, you know? So even the idea of glory and self-glorification, it's just an interesting upside down way of thinking that God yeah. would bring glory to himself in the creation, his expression of creating all these other things. And then he gives the, the beauty of humanity his own likeness and his own image. Um, and so I think we have to understand there are different categorical ways that we understand uh, each other and God, and God is outside of our personal categories, you mm. know? Um, and so he is perfection. He is um, f like the purest form of love that we could ever think of. Um, and so if we, at, at times we might be tempted to think, well, is God narcissistic, you know? Does sure. he have these narcissistic tendencies? And it feels not fair. Mm -hmm. um, well, the problem is our actual heart alignments are knocked off kilter, mm -hmm. you know? And so yeah. we're trying to define God based off of our faulty definitions versus seeing, well, no, we need to reset 
Our hearts need a reset, and we need to see God in perfection based off of his terms and his categories. Well, and I also think you have to remember God did something that a narcissist will not do. Mm -hmm. And that is that God gave humans the choice to love him or not love him. Mm -hmm. And a narcissist cannot do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. A narcissist says, you must not just love me, you must admire me. Adore me. And Adore. Yeah. if you don't, I will plan my exit so I never give you the chance to exit. Mm. And that's the opposite of what God does. God says, I will give you a choice to love me. And if you don't, I'll continue to pursue you until your dying breath. Absolutely. So I think that's an important distinction. And, and why, you know, the, I feel like it's such the ultimate act of humility that God gave humans the choice to love him or to not love him. Yeah. And I think that's an important distinction. For sure. Don't you think, too, I'm going to borrow your words there, because I'm going to use these. These are good, what you just said. God says, and he will pursue people till their dying breath. And the narcissist says, you'll be in a relationship with me. You better pursue me yes. till your dying breath. Mm -hmm. yes. Or you will be cut off. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Just It almost mimics God. It's such a disorder of worship around a narcissist, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I almost think, too, the... Um, giving our worship to God and keeping in mind that we are made in God's image. Mm -hmm. To me, sometimes I feel like, you know, it's, it's almost to me like lifting up who God is so I can better understand who I am mm -hmm. in relation yeah. to mm -hmm. him. Like God, you are faithful, therefore I am safe. Mm -hmm. God, you have a plan, therefore I don't have to be stuck in fear. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So God's worship, it, 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 we give it to him, but it doesn't end with him. Yeah. You know, it's, it is, it comes back on us yeah. as, the reassurance of because he is there therefore i i am you know and even in my identity sake mm -hmm. you know because god is the one who created me um and he he is the one who said i knit you together yes. in your mother's womb mm -hmm. god you mm -hmm. are the creator and you create good and therefore you know, there is good in me that has been created. Yeah. Um, in fact, while we were working on the trustworthy study, we actually went through the attributes of God, you mm -hmm. know? And one of the things that I love to do is to actually go through and say, okay, what are the attributes of God? Well, God is omniscient, which means he's all knowing. Okay, God, I can trust you because you're all knowing. I don't have to be all knowing because you're all knowing. God is omnipresent, right? So he's everywhere at all times. Well, that is a relief because God, you're everywhere. I don't need to be everywhere, mm -hmm. you know? He's om uh, omniscient. He's uh, omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He's all, all powerful. God, because you're all powerful, I don't have to stress out over <laughs> the reality of my limited power, yeah. mm -hmm. you know? So, and I don't have to try to be so controlling. Mm -hmm. When things feel out of control, I can remember who is in control, yeah. right? Yeah. So let's get to this um, this thought about, just a reminder, the narcissistic wounding, which is where the presentation of um, narcissistic tendencies come out, it presents as pride, but the wounding is actually a deep shame. We mm -hmm. talked about that yes. in the previous podcast, and I encourage you to go back and listen to that one if you haven't. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I want to remind everybody, we're not talking about this because we want you to suddenly no. start diagnosing <laughs> yourself yeah. or diagnosing other people. Um, but I do think it's healthy because in its most base form, um, at the very end of the spectrum is selfishness and we all have selfishness because it really is if you if you think about the wounding of it it it's this emptiness wound and to some extent we can all be like the person that's holding out a cup saying fill me yeah. right and so i think this topic is very interesting to sure. talk about but when when that selfishness is taken to a more extreme presentation, you can mm. find yourself in a relationship where someone is making it all about them. Mm. And at first, the relationship feels so thrilling because they're charming and they feel 
um, grander than just the basics of life, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so it is a very seductive thing to get pulled into a relationship with someone who has some of these narcissistic tendencies. Mm -hmm. But what you come to eventually realize is you are there to be a supply of endless adoration and period admiration to them. Yeah. Well, wow. there right. is nothing else. And By the it's way, a one way. It is one way. And the, and the two types of narcissists that are classically known as covert and overt narcissists. And so watch out especially for the covert because mm -hmm. the overt narcissist, what you've just described, is they can be exciting. They're certainly not boring, seductive, and all this can feel good up front. People will miss, they'll see that narcissist coming, but they'll miss the covert. That's the more overt narcissist. The covert one will be, but I didn't see that up front. They were kind. It might be a doctor there with, could be a minister, could be just someone they're in a relationship with. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly two, three kind of conversations or relationship encounters in, then it becomes more overt. Two classic types of narcissism, overt and covert. The covert often doesn't show up later and it can be like, well, I didn't see this coming. Mm -hmm. so. And what, what, what is the presentation of that? I said one is that the relationship really, mm -hmm. you start to understand it really is just one way towards them. Mm -hmm. And is it that they just don't ask very much about you? Or is it that they, when you need them, they just don't have very much to give? Keep going. You're good. Um, yeah. Right? And, and then part of it, if you'll look, I call it every narcissist has a boomerang mentality. It'll come out through you. And so, oh, that feels good, but it's always going to boomerang right back to them. Mm. So part of that is it will always be that usually the empath experientially or the echo or the narcissistic supply, usually experientially they don't have a me. Meaning I'm not even aware of who I am. They don't have a me. I've got almost this other-centered thing filling myself up because there's a benefit for the feed person, the empath or the codependent, pick a term. They get a benefit of being in the dance relationship with the narcissist. But mm. the narcissist, you'll look for signs. It'll always be about him or her, like always. Even when it feels like it's not, just look closely. So you want to observe, do a lot of observing of the narcissist. It'll always be about that person. A narcissist has never met a boundary that they like or will honor. So if you begin to say no or not this time, watch body language, just a twitch or whatever else, okay? So watch if you don't have in a moment where they might feel that narcissist, this is a moment, might be a simple moment, that this is a moment should be all about me and I wanna be praised and you don't praise, maybe others are and you don't join in or you're by yourself and you don't praise, you'll see the action reaction or an ab reaction sometimes we call it away from them and then lastly is inside with that narcissistic person one of the telltale signs is listen for a monologue not a dialogue wow. if they're going on waxing eloquent and going on sometimes run a timer and watch metaphorically or literally they will go on and on in a monologue and you sit there and go this is a one-way conversation it's not hard, I'm telling you, to spot, spot someone with narcissistic tendencies. They're very much out there. If you watch, not hard to spot. Okay, so I would imagine some of the listeners right now would be having a response like me, like, oh my goodness, um, I can instantly recount times I've been selfish and, and maybe I've had monologue conversations and, right. you know, am I a narcissist? You know yeah, what I'm saying? Absolutely. Are you having that thought too, Joel? Uh, technical I'm on like, both uh, you. Jim? You know what a technical is in sports? You know, I'm throwing the yellow football flag. Yeah. Why? You already know the answer you both do. Notice the self-awareness Lisa just talked about. Mm -hmm. Am I the nar narcissist or not self-aware? A sociopath can be more self-aware, more calculated. So when you say, I'm having the thought, and we've already said our disclaimers, we're not here to diagnose anyone. Okay, we're not doing therapy as such on these podcasts. You went to self-awareness. Oh my goodness, is that me? Could I be that? You've already kind of de-rolled as a narcissist because a narcissist is never going to ask that question. Does that make sense? Okay. I, mean, I know so, you know that. Whew, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, that, that was terrifying, Jim. I'll be honest. Are like, you better? I feel a lot better right your now. Pulse. Yeah, Thanks. you're good. Okay, perfect. Well, now that we've gotten that settled, but maybe I am that curious. helps you too, because I know if I'm listening to this, that's that's starting to emerge in my head. So we just had to settle that. Okay. But I'm ahead. curious, Jim, then mm -hmm. how does the narcissist or the person with those tendencies become aware of that? Well, you're getting into, which I'm not afraid to go to, the basic, the treatment 
or the therapy or the discipleship or life coaching of a narcissist. And part of that is, even in the secular research, would be something like dealing with cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. Uh, that's not CBD, right? So know your letters. Um, but it is, it is to get them to have some level mirroring back to them. I call it, which you've asked me before, Jim, we don't want to feed the narcissist. And yet, Jim, you've talked about you do feed the narcissist. I'm doing that strategically to know you want to shut, you want to shut the whole thing down with the narcissist, confront them. So I feed them by giving them affirmations and say, I'll ask questions like, you're not, but if you were a narcissist, yeah. Joel, are you open to a thought? See, right, they get to feel the power that you mean I get to respond. They don't want unsolicited advice, mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll compliment them, I'll feed them that way. Part of them to get them on board that they might literally, as best you can do, feel safe with you yeah. and be able to open up and say, is this how you want to live? Do you ever feel like the relationship's not working? If I can get them open, I'm not worried about deep character logical change. I'm looking for a one degree change that I can build some safety that they'll begin to open up. And sometimes if it's just pure strategy to how not live as a narcissist, that may be all I get, wow. but I'm gonna try at least. So one thing to remember, and we talked about this on the last show, is when dealing with a person with narcissistic tendencies or even narcissistic personality disorder, which right. again is a mental illness that must be diagnosed. And, and actually a much smaller percent of the population would would qualify mm -hmm. as Probably that. about one percent okay yeah. so in a situation where we are dealing with lots of different people lots of different personalities um i think it's always important to remember that if you start to pick up that someone has an absolute lack of empathy toward you big sign that's a big sign mm -hmm. and i think if it is apparent that they are always going to push you away before you would ever have the opportunity to reject mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. that's another mm -hmm. big sign mm -hmm. and so let's talk about the work environment maybe sure. somebody's in a work environment and they're like wow i i think i'm in this kind of a situation here are some of the thoughts that you may have if you are working with a narcissist mm -hmm. am i crazy <laughs> like, am i crazy because at first, we talked about how seductive it is to get pulled into a situation with a narcissist. That's right. But living there long term, it will start to make you feel crazy. Why is that, Jim? Because it is quite simply crazy. Um, narcissists will treat people, this is a classic calling card of a narcissist, they'll mm. treat people as an object, not as a person. Mm. So we're not wired to be objectified relationally or in any other way. So inside, you're there, and relationships are built on some level of interaction. Well, it's a one-sided relationship with a narcissist. So it is crazy that if you try to be kind and affirm and you get some brownie points thrown your way, or they affirm you, because again, the echo or the supply gets some, they, we get a little reward there, we gotta be honest about that. In the end, we'll realize there is a hole in the narcissist bucket. He or she will never be filled up, and I certainly can't praise him enough, and it will always boomerang to be about this person. So I feel like we've gotten some dialogue. We really got some interchange. We don't. It's a monologue and a one-way street. I thought it was a bit of a two-way street here. Did feel like that for a while. Be aware, it will never be a two-way street. Mm -hmm. So it's crazy making because I, but I thought I had something here. You did, but it wasn't what you thought. And mm -hmm. also in some of the books that I've read, um, part of the reason you start to feel so crazy is because you start to feel like you are the problem. They want you to be the problem at mm -hmm. some level, yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, at times that, that pushing away, if they sense that you're gonna question them or if you one up an idea, like I'm thinking in terms of a business meeting. No, um, no, that's a they, no, no. <laughs> they have to do everything they can to absolutely shut you down. Mm -hmm. So they would think enough, uh, nothing of berating you publicly in a meeting where you walk out and feel absolutely cut down to zero. And suddenly they've positioned themselves in the meeting as the one who knows how to rescue everyone else from your bad advice. And the scary mm -hmm. part is, all the research on narcissism, usually that narcissistic person 
is unaware that they're doing it in the moment. If you think it's all calculated, you don't understand narcissism. So it's often a sociopath more calculated. A narcissist is not aware in the moment, in the moment, that they're doing these things. So whether it's like their conscious seared is with a hot iron or something mm -hmm. else, that's the scary part. It just enhances the fear of it. They're not aware they're doing it. Don't steal the glory of the narcissist or in the metaphor of the Wizard of Oz, sometimes you're not trying to do it, but you're Toto. Mm -hmm. You just pull them back the curtain to see, and what's the words, pay no, out of the narcissist's mouth, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Sometimes you, I wasn't trying to expose you. Mm -hmm. One up you in a business meeting, I know this wouldn't happen, but imagine if that ever happened in a board meeting in a church and you one up a pastor or something. That wouldn't happen, would mm -hmm. it? Could be, who knows? But the idea that somebody's just trying to put their, their wisdom in or make a statement, but the narcissist feels like this is a threat to my very core. Well, no, it's not, but they think it is, and bad things happen when they feel threatened. So what are we supposed to do about it? I think it's helpful yeah. to give people some <clears throat> scripts. And then, Joel, I want to go to some biblical examples mm -hmm. of where we see some of this play out in Scripture mm -hmm. and the heart attitude of differentiation between um, different biblical characters mm -hmm. that some display some mm -hmm. narcissistic tendencies and other that take maybe a mistake they've made and their response to being confronted or called out and the difference that they do. Mm -hmm. But um, I've read two interesting books, Jim, and you recommended both of these. Um, one, it's interesting, you just mentioned Wizard of Oz because there's one book title called The Wizard of, Wizard of Oz and Other Narcissists, right? right? Mm -hmm. And these aren't Christian books, they're, but they are very, very helpful counseling books. Mm -hmm. um, the other is um, a book called The Object of My Affection is... In my reflection, in my reflection. Cal Lerner's book, yeah. wow. and um, in that book, she gave some great scripts. So let me just read yeah. this really quickly. When you insult me, so this is like if you we were in that business meeting that we mm -hmm. just talked about. Um, so let's say Jim, we're just going to let you play the role of the narcissist, not the, that you I are would be at glad all. To. <laughs> okay, so you've now attacked me, and now I know I've got to address this with you, but I do not want to have a conversation where I'm tapping into your shame, because remember, that's at the root of the that's narcissist. Right. So I've got to figure out how do I confront without being confrontational. And I also have to remember what you said. You, you, you need to feed the narcissist, and it isn't that you are playing his game. Right. It's that you know how to best help him here, right? Outsmart the narcissist a little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's some examples. Uh, Jim, when you insulted me during our meeting, it made me feel very blindsided. I want to learn from you because you... I've already shut down as a narcissist, so you know. Okay, but does this help? I want to learn from you. Well, you started with, when you insulted me, I'm gone. Okay. As a narcissist, I've left. All right, so then I need to start off with Jim... When you said blah, 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 uh -huh. are you open to let me tell you what I felt? Okay, so... So that's the that confrontation. Maybe you need to insulted. write a book on this. I was right? going to say, um, yes, so, that was very good. But what Raquel is saying in her book, she's saying, I want to learn from you because you have so much to teach me. Mm -hmm. My request is that you stop calling me names so that I can really listen without becoming distracted. If this happens at future meetings, I will have to leave the room temporarily, but but be assured, I will return. So that's what Raquel said. So I don't know. And what I'm not fighting with Raquel Lerner. I've met her. I like her. She's great. I think for me, that implies a little bit further down the road versus the first time Perfect. when you insulted me. But after a while, I want all the clients I work with, people I work with to get their boundaries clear and say, look, I'm calling it what it is. This is about fourth rodeo with this. Okay. When you insulted me there, mm -hmm. I'm claiming my truth. I'm not feeding you anymore, blah, blah, blah. And then it's about, I'm going to have my boundaries on my side and I don't want to pull the narcissistic thing. They all want a boomerang to come back to them, the narcissist. I don't want to be like that. I'm going to shoot what I call shoot straight like an arrow versus a boomerang. My arrow is I'm going to speak my truth, Ephesians 4.15, in mm -hmm. love. And I'll say, when you insulted me, when you said this, I fell and put up a boundary. I think that for me would be down the road initially with a person. If you don't know the person, or you've never spoken your truth, then I think that's just going to be game one and going to fight. And secondly, I, would, I think she's implying there, I would make sure that I don't do that in, 
in the public square. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Raise my yes. hand. So yeah. we have a friend, Lisa, who often in our theology study days will raise her hand and yes. say, I just want to represent for the average yeah. person. I and I feel like is. I'm having a role reversal in this Perfect. moment. So Good I just for want you. To, so I'm going to raise my hand and ask for the average average person. What y'all are just describing feels like so much effort. Like even thinking through the nuances of how to present this question and where the person is, what would you say for the person like me who just feels like uh, it's not worth it? This seems too hard. I would start. Can I speak to that first? Yeah. I would take your own wisdom and ponder that very question. Is it worth it? I don't have to show up to every drama I'm invited to. And to say, wow. I want to ponder, is it worth it for me to engage in this person. Once I go down three quick points, if I can real quick, tying into that, educate yourself. The internet is filled with more than you could do in a million years to read and go, I'll know the signs, symptoms, two types of narcissists. Some people say there's six types. Educate yourself about that. So get really aware of what to look like, look for signs and symptoms. Be simply an observer of the person. All of us have that wisdom. May I come from James? The person who lacks faith or you lack wisdom, ask God, God, give me wisdom with this person. I want to be discerning. And then just simply be an observer. I see that. And don't doubt yourself. This is going on. Notice, I feel unsafe here. Different than you're unsafe. I'm not feeling safe here. Said it earlier in the podcast. Have community. Call a friend and say, look, this is what's going on. I'm not gossiping. This is what was said or done. I feel unsafe. I feel gaslighted by this person. And I tell the person says, look, I know you. I would feel the same thing. So you can be an observer and then, of course, in a healthy way, stop feeding the narcissist. At that point, knowing, because there is a payoff. When you deal with corporate America, and I really believe in churches as well at times, in corporate America, I'll say, I've had people in my office myriad of times saying, if I draw healthy boundaries with a narcissistic boss, even with HR and all that involved, I'll probably be fired, blacklisted, mm -hmm. cut off something. So I have to be aware, you're quite... Is it worth it? Some people have had to leave a job saying, I'm not fighting well, that fight anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think what you're saying too, Joel, is I can't remember this big, long script. So <laughs> let me give you yeah. just some simple statements. Okay. Um, that, again, I'm, I'm pulling straight from Raquel's Go, book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, like, that's a very interesting opinion. You see, you're, what you need to do is you, you need to, in the moment, be able to go get away from whoever is in the um, situation. So if it's the narcissist attacking you, mm -hmm. then your job, you're going to have to get away and regulate. Mm -hmm. and As a narcissist, I wanted to lean in when you said that. I thought, ooh, yes. you said that. And that's a, my Jim's version. You fed the narcissist in a good way there. That's an interesting opinion, not you, dummy. But that's <laughs> that really is, an, that interesting, is an interesting I found myself opinion. leaning in. That is an interesting opinion. Wow. I need... I need to think about that for a few minutes, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I, um, I'll get back to you on that. Yeah. Or here's another one. She said, um, I really want to think about what you're saying. Okay. So that's I love good. that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and then another one is, um, why is this so important to you? I'd love to know more. Listen okay. to the nuance of the language. May I? Yes. Why is this so important? Fair. Imagine a different sotto voce in music, the softer voice almost of, huh, tell me, why is this so important? I see, it's so important to you. I believe you. Why is this so important? That's that curiosity piece to feed him a little bit so I don't hear anything. It sounds like, why is this so, huh, why is this so important? I believe it is. Tell me more. And then two others like, maybe so, or, hmm, could be. Hmm. Yeah. It was interesting. I remember one of my friends, her name is Angela Thomas. She's an author and a speaker. Uh, she, uh, sometimes when she gets harsh emails from people, um, and I don't know if she's picking up on some kind of narcissistic tendency or anything like that, but I loved her response. She told me one time, she says, sometimes I just simply write back, um, you could be right. I mm. guess we'll find out in heaven. Wow. And she just leaves it at that. So I know we're running out of time today, but really quick, Joel, uh, two personalities that I think about from the Bible that are such a good distinction to study mm -hmm. um, is Solomon and David. Mm -hmm. And I know when I look at the life of Solomon, it started out so promising, so amazing, so many blessings from God, right? Mm -hmm. But 
there is this real pivotal moment in first kings where it says but solomon clung Clunk. to his foreign, foreign wives, wives. Yeah. and i think about that in this conversation i'm not saying solomon was a narcissist but i am saying there's such a distinction between solomon clung to those wives and sacrifice to their foreign gods and sacrifice to the foreign gods betraying his own relationship with the lord after the mm -hmm. lord had blessed him so much and the response of david, david. Mm -hmm. who was also caught in uh a not great situation yeah, with Bathsheba. multiple multiple situations right he was caught in. <laughs> and including the one with Bathsheba. yes and um and what he says in Psalm 51. Yeah. He doesn't blame anyone else. He doesn't shame anyone else. He did not cling to what he wanted or what he felt like he must have from other humans. Mm -hmm. He simply said, God, I just stand here. Read Psalm 51. I think it's fascinating. Any yeah. last thoughts as we wrap up today? Yeah, I mean, Psalm 51, we can kind of camp out there. Psalm 51, create in me a new heart, O oh God. And we've studied this in depth, Lisa, that uh, Hebrew word for create is bara, which is not a heart renovation. Like, I need you to come in and do a Chip and Joanna and do some, you know, new uh, appeal in here. No, it is actually, I need you to create something brand new. In fact, this is the exact same word that's used in Genesis when it says that God created the heavens and the earth. He created ex nihilo, a Latin yeah. phrase that means out of nothing. And so this is that hope-filled message of where are you on the spectrum of narcissism? Are you on tendencies? Is this a disorder where clinical psychologists would say, there is no hope. Well, as believers, my goodness, we have hope. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus, through the power of the Spirit, can literally create something that is so brand new. And that heart can be brand new. Um, I was just studying on uh, the word narkeo, the Greek word, which comes from mm -hmm. nar narcissist. That's where we get that, that word. It means to grow numb by applying pressure. Like narcotic. Like narcotic. Very much. And it was really interesting, the tense of the word, to grow numb. It's not an instant numbness. It's over a period of time. As I'm hearing the both of you talk, I'm thinking, my goodness, there is opportunity time and time again for healing, for restoration, for renewal. But I thought it was interesting about the pressure. The, the, it's by applying pressure. What is that pressure? And I thought about sometimes when you sit on your foot, you know, mm -hmm. and if you sit on your foot for too long, it gets numb. And you don't, like, all of a sudden, then you try to stand up, and it's just this weird feeling. Yeah. Well, what happened? Your blood circulation actually got cut off from your foot. So over a period of time, the source, the heart that pumps blood was not able to get to that extremity, to that foot. Um, and I just began to think, oh, my goodness, I think what's happening over a period of time for the person struggling with narcissism is that they are cutting themselves off from the source of life. Amen. And that person is Jesus. And so what we have to do is point them back orient our hearts and their hearts back to the source of living water. Can I join you on Psalm 51? You yes. both know it. How does the passage start? Narcissists won't say that typically. It goes vertical. Have mercy on me, O God. That's how that passage starts. He starts off with, be merciful to me. That humility. And I'll work with, hopefully a narcissist can, can learn some behavioral and say, would you try? Do you feel like, are you willing to be willing to be willing to repent or own that? And say, yeah, maybe back here I am. Have mercy on me, O oh God. Mm. Vertical humility. Love it. Yeah. So the last thing I'll say as we wrap up today is maybe you've been listening and you've been thinking about a significant relationship in your life and you're now concerned that maybe I don't have the theological training to be able to properly navigate this. I don't want to think that this person in my life is a narcissist, but I don't know what to do about that. That's why I want to encourage you definitely, like Jim said, get educated. There are some fantastic books we recommended too here on the podcast, but also um, find a trusted Christian counselor mm -hmm. to help you navigate that relationship because it is going to be hard for you to navigate it on your own and be honest with yourself. Yes. You know, I, I think for me sometimes having a more positive bent in life i always want to believe the best and i think that's a really good quality yes. until it isn't <laughs> and so sometimes it's really hard for me to believe that what i'm experiencing is as damaging as it is mm. and so here's what i want to say to you 
It really isn't about diagnosing that person you're in a relationship with as a narcissist. That's not what we're trying to do. But if you are in a relationship that is abusive, that is one way, that is taking the best of who you are and beating it down. I don't mean physically so much. I mean emotionally. If you walk away from that person and you think less of yourself mm. every single time, it really doesn't matter if they are a narcissist or not. Mm. You need to get help. Mm. So who you get help from? A trusted friend, someone trusted at your church, a counselor, um, maybe even um, a sister or a brother, but you need to find someone that you trust and you need to be honest about what you're experiencing and tell them you need help. So we'll end it there today. Thank you guys so much. My be pleasure. sure to yeah. stay in touch with us. You can subscribe to the podcast. You can like and share. That's right. Pass you can the word. share. Tell people about this um, and use us as a resource yeah. to yeah. start toward the healing, whatever healing it is that you need. Thank yeah. you so much. Mm -hmm.